Good evening viewers and welcome to yet another evening of Bible study. I preach on behalf of the Apostle Ellsworth Williams and his wife, Pastor Carmen Williams, the elders, leadership and congregation of the Heavenly Light World Outreach Fellowship. And we truly delight in coming into your homes to discuss with you the precious word of God. And today we will enable, we will try to wrap up Ezra chapter 3, and we are starting at verse 10, and we will read through to the end, verse 13, and that should bring us to the conclusion of Ezra chapter 3. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord, because he is good, for his mercy endured forever toward Israel. And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers, who were ancient men, but had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. So that the persons, so that the people, I'm sorry, could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard afar off. And so today we will be between verse 11 and verse 13. Verse 10 and verse 13. And so, we, last week we looked at the preparation for the building of the foundation. And just a very short review, God was able to um, release unto us the fact that the foundation, there was need for preparation. And the actual preparation involved not only persons that were from the, the Jewish nation, but preparation involved using and supplies coming from persons out of the Jewish nations. And so you would find that sometimes not every single thing we need would come the way we had anticipated that it would come. Also, there was the situation in which there were persons who were ministering unto the Lord, but then the foundation was not laid. And so many times we can be ministering unto the Lord, but there's a deeper and there's a greater work that God wants to do for us and through us and with us. But we are caught in this area and this arena. And so the Lord encouraged us last week that there is greater and we should seek to lay that foundation for the greater in God. The Lord also showed us a few things about the foundation. The foundation is unseen, but it carries the load and the burden. We were able to identify our foundation as Jesus Christ. This week, we are going to look at what happened after the foundation was laid. And the first thing we recognize after the foundation was laid according to the word of God is that they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. After the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And so we saw that there was a shift. And if you were to begin to look at what was happening at the, at the beginning of this, this chapter, you will recognize that the first thing that they did was they built an altar. And when they built the altar, they we were able to identify the fact that they were now going back into, they were returning to God in terms of responding to him. But the return and the response was of such a nature that it was equated with the Abrahamic move. And every single time Israel acted or did something, it was related to a move. It was related to a move towards God. It was related to a move in terms of the relationship with God. And so Israel built the altar and we were able to equate that with the Abrahamic move because Abraham was the patriarch who built altars unto the Lord as a way of responding to the Lord and as a way of communicating with the Lord in his journey with God. And then we saw also 
that after building altars that they began to give offerings and so they offered unto the Lord. And the word of God says to us very, very clearly that those offerings were done according to Moses, the man of God. And so we see there the mosaic move or the mosaic shift, the mosaic realm. And so Israel, if you look at what's happening, they're coming back to God. They're coming back, they're building. They've begun to rebuild, but even as they're rebuilding, God is restoring. He is restoring because with every single move, there is a representation of a realm of relationship with God. Every move, and so the Abrahamic move is a representation of a realm of relationship. Abraham responding to God, having come, in, come out of ancestral settings and, and cultures, etc. And then secondly now, they're doing offerings, and, and this speaks also of the mosaic move, the mosaic realm, and, and God is restoring relationship as it was in the time of Moses. And we know with Abraham, Abraham was counted as God's friend. We know that Moses was counted as his servant, and, and both of them spent time with God. They built relationship with God. Abraham was for, for more than a month up in the mountains with God. Not Abraham, I'm sorry, Moses. Moses, but Abraham journeyed with God throughout, building several altars unto the Lord. At one point, Abraham was there over the sacrifice from morning until sundown, and he was there fanning it, waiting for God. So these are men who knew what it is to dig in with God. And so even within the activities of Israel, there was something happening in the spiritual dimension that God was actually restoring realms and capacities and, and, and and, and the room for Israel to come into such a level of relationship with him. And now that the foundation is built, there has been another shift, and this shift is actually into the Davidic realm, a Davidic move. And so there is a further restoration, and what God has been doing, he has been restoring the landmarks of the fathers of Israel. He has been restoring those landmarks of relationship, those landmarks of response to him. Okay, and so every single time Israel acted, it was actually equated with a move. It was significant of a, of a move or a realm in terms of God. And we see that the temple is built and they have begun to worship and, and they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. And the word of God said they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord because he is good for his mercy and jure forever. And so this time of praise, because they move from a place of building an altar onto the place of offering, and now they've come into a place of praise and thanksgiving. And they're doing this not because David has said it, but they're doing it and they're specifying why. Because God is a good God and his mercy endureth forever. And so Israel goes into a place of praise. And so, just like we said, every act of Israel was connected, okay, with God and significant of, of restoration of relationship with God. And so, sometimes what happens to us is that we return to acts in order to appease God. Because remember, Israel was into acts. But God does not desire the acts of man. God desires the hearts of man, okay? Or the heart of man. He doesn't want our acts. And, and as our heart is okay, our acts will come into alignment as a demonstration, a manifestation of what's happening in our heart. And this is the way God wants it. But sometimes what happens, is that we find ourselves in that place where we feel we can appease God, we can force a response from God as a result of acts. And, but what happens in a case like that is that we become ritualistic or we become religious because we're just doing this because it was done before and God had acted in such a way as a result of it being done. But God is not after our acts. God is after our heart. God is after 
our hearts. Okay? And so, even as we look at verse 11, we are told at the latter part of the verse, and all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord, because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. And so, in verse 11, we see all the people shouting with a great shout. All the people. And this speaks of a corporate sound. All the people the word of God said. A corporate sound. It meant that they were in one accord. They released a corporate sound. There wasn't a tongue that was silent. There wasn't a mouth that was shut. The word of God said all the people shouted with a great shout. And so this corporate sound produced a great shout. But by the time we got to verse 12, we see but many of the priests and Levites and chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes wept with a loud voice. Okay? They wept with a loud voice. And so it began with a great shout. All mouths were open, shouting, and then, then, as the ancient men began to ponder on the first house, as they began to think about the last move, as they began to think about the former things, as they began to think about what it used to be, the word of God said that they wept with a loud voice. Because the word of God said that they wept with a loud voice. And so now, here comes a different sound. Here comes a different sound. The sound of the weeping of the ancient men with a loud voice. And then the word of God says, in the same verse, following immediately, and many shouted aloud for joy. And so, on the one hand, you've got this different sound of those who are weeping. And on the other hand, you've got a definite sound of those who are shouting for joy. Okay? And the word of God says to us, okay, that the men wept with a loud voice. And so it moved from a great shout to a voice. And so what's happening? What started in unison and in unity and as a corporate shout really unto God is now in a situation where there is a division. There is a different sound, which is a voice. And then there's a different, definite shout, which is a, which is a, a definite sound, which is a loud shout of joy. And so what we have here is a clash of sounds. We have a clash of sounds. The foundation is laid and there is a clash of sounds. And one would want to say, what's going to happen here? But this is the beauty of God. Because God is not after man's acts. God is after man's heart. And because he's after man's heart, he would have recognized that the ancient men, they loved him. They desired him. And, but what was happening to them is that they were looking at the former thing. They were looking at the last move. They were looking at how it used to be. And so their eyes were holding as a result of their former experience. And sometimes what happens to us as we're in God is that if our eyes are not on him, and our eyes are on what we went through, our eyes are on what we experienced, our eyes on how it used to be, it prevents us from coming in to what it needs to be. It wasn't that they were in the right place, okay? It wasn't that they were where they should be, but God came to where they were. He came to where they were because their hearts were right. Their hearts were right. They wanted to be a part. They, they wanted a foundation built. They were in the move. But the problem was their eyes. And the beautiful thing about God is he understood their heart. He understood their heart. And because their hearts were right, they were not divorced from the move. But God was able to include them. And so God took the clash of sound 
God took the clash of sound. He took the, the shout for joy. And he took the loud voice of weeping. And he brought them together. And he made a noise. He made a noise. You see, God would have an agenda. And nothing prevents God. Nothing prevents God from meeting his agenda. And God had an agenda. It was a season. It was a time for Israel to come into the place where it was known that Israel was in the land. Now the people had come and they had taken up their place. But if we check out when they built the altar, what was happening, they did not put it high. The word of God says because of fear of the people around them. And so they placed it very low. When we look at what was happening with the offering, everything seemed to be quiet. Yes, they were doing what they were supposed to be doing, but they were doing it in a very restricted manner. In it, they were doing it in such a way that they did not want to offend the others. They did not want anyone to know that they were there. Two years almost, they were in the land. And Israel was tiptoeing because of the nations around them. But it was time to break the silence. And there comes a time when the silence has got to be broken. And this was the time for the silence to be broken because the foundation was laid. The capacity to take the weight, the capacity to take the force, the prophetic capacity to take the weight and to take the force of what the other nations around would do was laid. And so it was a season when Israel could have faced combat. And so the Lord took the definite sound and he took the different sound and he brought them together and he produced a noise. He produced a noise. And the word of God said, that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. For the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. Sometimes we've got to break the silence. We've got to break the silence because the silence is more than the absence of sound. The silence is the presence of fear. The silence is the presence of restraint. The, 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 the silence is the presence of imprisonment. The silence is the presence of a lack of liberty. And so the Lord would make a noise come forth, a noise that will be heard, a noise that will break the shackles of intimidation, a noise that will break the shackles of fear, a noise that will break the shackles of anxiety. A noise that will break apprehension. And it came out of two factions. But when the heart is in the thing, when the heart is in the thing, God is able to move. But I believe that God is talking to someone who at this time may be tiptoeing. I mean, be very scared to bring offense because of all that's happening around you. And you're very scared to be yourself. And you're very scared to stand. But this is the time to break the silence. This is the time to break the silence. God is going to change your sound. He's going to change your sound from a whisper to a shout. He's going to change your sound. And he's going to change your activity and bring you into that place where your restraint is cast off. The word of God said that the sound, the noise was heard afar off. The noise was heard afar off. It was time for the nations to know that Israel was here. Israel had been in the place for almost two years. But now, Israel was announcing prophetically their presence. And this is a time and a season when the Lord will announce someone's presence. This is a time and a season when God is moving you from the back to the front, not necessarily in the manner that you anticipated, but God has got the ability 
to take the negative and the positive together and to get whatever he wants to give. All he's asking is that the heart be in the right place. That the heart be in the right place. And he sees and he knows he's saying to someone that your heart is for me. But I see the fear, I see the worry, I see the desire not to offend. He said, but this is the time and this is the season when I'm changing your soul because it's the time for the breaking of the silence. Lord, I believe this is the time for the breaking of the silence of the church. And this is not a breaking that may necessarily be the way we want it to be. Because this was not a breaking of a worship. This was the breaking through a worship shout, through a prayer shout, through a thanksgiving shout. And out of those shouts came the breaking of the silence, the dismantling of so many things, and another dimension of activities. And I believe it's the same for the body of Christ. I believe it is the same for the individual scene. That for many of us, God is bringing us into a place where the silence of the past year, the past two years, and for some lots and lots of years before, is being broken. Many of us would feel that things are not the way they should be. And so our prayers might not be prophetic like others. Our prayers may even be negative because for some of us, we cry and, and we, we, we cry out to God about the negative things in our circumstances. For others, we are able to pray prophetically and declare the positive. But whichever way, God will come through because he's looking at the heart. And once the heart is in the right place, God will do what he says he will do. Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. We pray, oh God, even at this time, in the name of Jesus, that you will help us, oh Father, that you will have a corporate sound, that you will bring us into that place where we will make a great shout, oh Father, that you will remove, oh God, Oh, Father, those instances, Lord Jesus, where we are silent, that you will open the mouths that are silent, that you will bring into alignment, oh God, the hearts of those with a different sound, and you will bring, oh God, into alignment the hearts of those with a definite sound, and that you will produce the sound that you need, oh God, for this new season, that you will be able to do what you desire to do in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening. I trust the Lord it has been a blessing to you. May God give you a wonderful week. In Jesus' name, we love you. And every evil town is condemned. And in His name there is victory. I'm fighting for the cause of the master And the Lord is on my side Though the enemy he is fierce and threatening I will stand